Today we're going to be covering data management. Before we go ahead and talk about that, I'll just give a quick introduction of who I am. My name is Seth Sheikh. I am located in the United States, specifically in the state of Maryland, and I live pretty close to DC. I work as a data government specialist at this company called Prudential, which is a large insurance provider in the United States. And over there, I focus morely on metadata management, data cataloging. It's one of those things that I can talk about all day. In fact, we do have a whole chapter on metadata management. So once we get to that, I'm looking forward to sharing my insights. But even this chapter that we're going to be covering today, data management, this is actually, I believe, one of the most underrated, or maybe a chapter that kind of flies under the radar. The reason I say that is because from the CDMP exam perspective, it is only 2%. That basically means out of 100 questions, you might just see two questions from the specific chapter. Some people might just be like, I probably shouldn't have spent too much time on this chapter. But I would argue otherwise, because as a data governance professional, I really feel like this is one of my favorite chapters of the whole book, because it really does, I think, explain to me why I do the work I do, and even explains the underlying reason for the other chapters in the book. Why are we concerned with governing data? Why are we concerned with data quality? Why are we concerned with metadata management? Because at the end of the day, data is an extremely valuable asset. And as such, it has to be protected. It has to be governed, managed effectively so that the value from data can be derived the way it should be. And everything from like data security, data governance, all these other chapters that you'll encounter later in the book that are weighed more heavily. Ultimately, they all go back to the central premise of the data management chapter, which is that data is an extremely valuable asset and it has to be managed effectively. So that's a little bit about why I really like this chapter. Now, I do have my copy of the Dimbach open with the chapter. First off, in the introduction section on page number 17, one of the first things I underlined was that deriving value from data does not happen in a vacuum or by accident. It requires intention, planning, coordination, and commitment, and it requires management and leadership. This is super, super, super important because data by itself is not just going to magically give you these insights. It's not going to just allow you to better comply with different financial industry standards. It really does require active leadership and just active monitoring, governance, et cetera. Another part that I really like from this chapter on the same page 17, this is says the responsibility for managed data must be shared between business and information technology roles. And people in both areas must be able to collaborate and ensure an organization has high quality data that meets its strategic needs. This is actually one of the big challenge that happens with a lot of organizations when it comes to managing their data. Some companies for the longest time just thought data management of something that basically that's IT's responsibility. They kind of passed it off to them, but that couldn't be further from the truth. And in fact, that type of mindset has actually harmed companies more than it's helped. So at my company, I work under this person named Laura Sebastian Coleman, who actually wrote some parts of the Dimbach. And this morning we had a call with her and she's mentioned something that really resonated with me. That being that data is a team sport. And I was like, absolutely. It's not just something that IT professionals or data professionals need to be only concerned with. It needs to be something that's enterprise-wide. At the end of the day, everybody in an organization, regardless of what your specific role is, you will be generating data, some more than others. Managing responsibility isn't just a specific department's responsibility. Even if there's a data governance department at your company, their job is not to be the sole people who take care of the organization's data. They're just there to make sure that everybody else in the company is doing just that. So next, we go to page 18. In the business driver section, it talks about the primary driver for data management is to enable organizations to get value from their data assets. Just as effective management of financial or physical assets enable organizations to get value from those assets. This chapter does talk a lot about assets in like the most basic sense. Let's say you buy a house, right? But let's say over time you don't take care of the house. What's going to happen? The value is going to decrease. Eventually the house that you bought, its value will go down over time. And I really do feel like data in some ways is kind of similar from the data itself, like a huge data set. It can very much be a valuable asset, but if you don't really use it properly, if you're not classifying the data accordingly, if you're not really storing in a way that's easier for people to find, you know, it will lose its value. Another thing that was mentioned in this chapter is that data represents two things. It represents value. Absolutely. You can derive valuable insights. You can use those insights to help businesses grow, become more profitable. But at the same time, data also represents risk. Because if your data is not properly classified, somebody gets a hold of sensitive information and leaks it, that company is going to be hit with a giant fine, lawsuits even. That's all just chaotic things that can be avoided. Ultimately, you have us something back to this central premise of this chapter, that data is an extremely valuable asset. It represents value, but it also represents risk. So now for the context of the CDMP, I really feel like this next section is kind of important. It's going to be section 2.4, data management principles on page 21. Data is an asset with unique properties. 
that's just something that's of value, but it has to be managed so that the value from it can be derived as it should. I just wanted to add, I think data valuation is super underrated and it's very challenging. I think that's part of why it's not often an initiative that data teams undertake. But if you can quantify the value of your data and data improvements, the value that data products are driving for your business, that can help you to prioritize initiatives and build a business case for the appropriate level of investment in your organization's data management capabilities. I really like this book, Infonomics by Doug Laney. I think just any kind of thought experiment that you can do to quantify the value and the risks, the benefits and the costs associated with data, that can be really helpful. And I wish that was a chapter. Instead, they oh, just yeah. mention it briefly in chapter one and chapter three. Thank you for mentioning that, Nicole. It brings me to the second point of this principle, which is that the value of data can and should be expressed in economic terms. And I think the book really just says that the way we can really get people to truly understand the value of their data. But yeah, I agree. There's not really enough about data valuation. It just mentions that, but the actual way to do that, I think there's other sources out there for sure. That's not something that I think will necessarily be tested. Like how do you go about quantifying the value of data? Don't worry too much about that, but that's another really important aspect. And then the third one was managing data means the quality of data. And this is another big chapter later on. That's 11% of the exam, data quality. Let's say if you're a data visualization specialist and you want to make high quality dashboard that has accurate insights. Well, the insights is only as good as the quality of the data. If the data is inaccurate, incomplete, it just has all sorts of inconsistencies, then your insights that you produce will also be faulty. And that can be very troublesome because let's say you're trying to make a presentation to an executive or some higher level director, right? And you want to make a business case, a business proposal, but they spot inconsistencies, errors in your data or your visualization or your reports and they call it out Then you are in major trouble, but you will lose your trust, reputation. You want to eventually use data to convince people. And that's going to hurt your ability to do just that. Then another one is it takes metadata to manage data. That's another big chapter. That's also 11% of the exam on metadata management. For those who don't know what metadata is, basically they say it's data about data. I'll describe it as like information that describes data. Let's say you just have a random table or data set. Let's say there's no other information you have on it. If you are an analyst at a company, if you have any questions or if you weren't sure who to reach out to. That's kind of an issue. Do you know if this data set is any good? Is it old? Is there like a newer updated version out there? So that's where you have things like the owner of the data set that you can reach out to the primary contact, the file size, the columns, and see if those columns are associated to business glossary terms. So you can get a much more clear picture of what type of data this is. But I'm describing it as a data catalog. And that's what I do in my job. I build out a data catalog where we have all this technical metadata, but we have to basically translate it to business users who want to have a reference tool for them to better understand what type of data exists who to reach out to for more information. And Amanda asks, what tool do I use? Right now in my company, I use this tool called Informatica, Axon and EDC, Enterprise Data Catalog. But in this next couple of months, we're shifting over to a new tool called CDGC, which is also made by Informatica, which stands for Cloud Data Governance Catalog. So right now I'm learning that new system. My company is also gonna be working with vendors and we'll get all trained on that. So looking forward to it. So that's what tools I use. I'll give a little bit of insights of what I do. So like, I do a lot of data curation. That's a big part of my job and data curation basically just means you organize data within the organization and specifically, so you add meat to data that exists so that people can have more information about it. Our primary data consumers at Prudential is actually the data science team. That's the one that we're trying to market our tools towards. So we want to show them how we can like, if they're looking for a certain data set, a certain column or something like that, they can go into this tool. They can see all this information that can help them make better decisions. They can see that it's been updated very recently and other relevant information. Going back to data management principles, that's just another important aspect of data management is that you want to make sure the metadata is also higher quality, it's taken care of. Anybody have any questions on metadata management or data quality? Let's say you're working on a new organization and they're in the beginning stages of their data governance program mm -hmm. and you're tasked with working with the power users of data mm -hmm. and you want to start documenting a strategy for mm -hmm. them. As a data catalog mm -hmm. professional, what would be like your first way forward for your team? Because there's so many areas you can start. From your point of view, I wanted to hear some guidance. It's an excellent question. What do we do is we first have to find out who is the people who use the data the most. We need to first off assign responsibilities. And that's actually one of the big challenges of data governance and implementing it is that it really does involve a culture change. But it's not like, oh yeah, here's a data cataloging tool. Just use this and you're all good to go. 
And that's actually one of the biggest challenges of data governance, getting that buy-in from people. At the end of the day, you really have to emphasize that data governance isn't just an IT thing. It's not a business thing. It's a team sport. So first off, you need to find out who are the people who generate the most data, who use the most data at the company and get them to use the, the train, the trainer approach. So basically get the leaders who use the most data first, identify who those people are and get them to understand proper data management frameworks, principles. And then from that point on, send out effect communications for them to share with their teams. At the end of the day, I think a snowball approach is the best way when it comes to implementing a data governance for a new organization. Basically start small. I would never even consider like a tool when I was first considering a new client or something like that. You work with a new company or a new team. Cause I think that's a little too advanced. First, figure out the basics. Who are the primary data users? What are they using it for? Is the data stored somewhere? If not, can we build a repository, maybe like in SharePoint or whatever tool they're using? build out the basics. And then from that point on, eventually snowball into a bigger approach. I hope I answered your question. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. I just want to jump in here and add that prioritization is key because it's going to be impossible to manage all the data. Like Seth was saying, figuring out where is the data that's most critical to the business, where the power users are. That's the data that you should try to catalog first. The purpose of data management is to enable the business strategy. So given that we're always operating in the context of constrained resources, we need to really figure out what's critical and how that data should be managed across its life cycle. Thanks for stating that, Steph. Yep, no problem. So when you're taking the exam, on page 22, there's this really nice visual. I actually wrote it down as note card material. This just summarizes a lot of the stuff that I mentioned. It just talks about the data management principles, but it's like a nice little picture that you can just see all the ones I just mentioned. But it does have a life cycle from the day it's first produced to the day it's considered obsolete, it's archived and deleted or whatever. These are all things that organizations have to develop the plan. They have to account for this, understand the data in the organization, which stage is it in its life cycle. That's another thing data cataloging tools do is you can track data lineage. That way you can see data, is it transforming? Is it transforming too much? Or you can see if it's complying with industry standards. That's another data management principle that was on page 23. Another good one, managing data includes managing the risk associated with data. Like I mentioned, data represents value, but it also represents risk, right? But it can be lost, stolen, or misused. So organizations need to consider the ethical implications of their data usage. And data-related risk is something that needs to be managed actively during each stage of the management lifecycle. I think the last one, I think it's a really good one. Data management involves strong leadership commitment. At the end of the day, leadership, the one that really has to enforce the cultural shift of better data governance, data management. I've seen this in my company that I work at. There's people that have been working there for like decades, 20, 30 years. They're so used to doing things a certain way, even suggesting a small change here and there. It can definitely bring up a lot of resistance. Like I said, implementing a proper data management, data governance at a company really does involve starting small and just taking baby steps. And obviously that really has to do with leadership. They really have to be the ones who set the motion to do that. Those were the data management principles from this chapter. I think that's probably the heart of this chapter. Once you go on, read the other chapters in this book, you will, I think definitely will refer back to this chapter. Like, oh yeah, this was briefly mentioned here. At the end of the day, data is an extremely valuable asset. So that's why we concern ourselves with other chapters like data security, data governance, data quality, or metadata management. Then let's see, I'm looking over at section 2.5.1 on page 23. This is another good point. What makes data unique is that it's digital. It's, they say not tangible, but it's a digital asset. And that's the thing, assets, some of them are physical. Actually, most of them are physical. But like I said, assets can also be digital. I'm not like a crypto Bitcoin person, but that's an example of a digital asset. Data is also another digital asset. It mentions that data is easy to copy and transport, but it is not easy to reproduce if it gets lost or destroyed. That's why you need to always have data archived or stored, different version history. That's something that gets covered in the document and content management chapter. All these chapters are all just like, oh yeah, this is mentioned in other chapters going forward. So this is another good chapter I would suggest you check out. Data is also dynamic. It can be used for multiple purposes. Multiple people can use it. All right, so now on page 24, it does talk about data valuation. It actually does have its own little subsection. First off, it talks about the value, right? So value is the difference between the cost of a thing and the benefits derived from that same thing. For organizations' data, this mentioned like sample categories for data includes the cost of obtaining and storing the data, things like replacing data if it were lost. If it's not properly stored and you lose the data, that's costly because you'll have to spend extra time with the rework. And time is an extremely valuable thing in itself. That's not ideal for any organization. Same thing like impact to organization if the data were to go missing, benefits of higher quality data, what competitors would pay for that same data, what the data could be sold for, and expected revenue from innovative uses of the data. 
Amanda mentioned it's also costly to store unnecessary data. Exactly, because storage is expensive and that's why you want to make sure you don't have excessive duplicate or just bad quality data. There's an environmental impact too of all the data that is stored. Those data centers require a lot of energy because you got to keep the server racks very cool. So there was this huge boom in cloud technology really since the late 2010s. And now we're, according to some, entering an era of defensible disposal where organizations need to be more focused on building enterprise data models and only storing the data that supports business use cases. You will not okay. be tested on this information. <laughs> yeah. I just want to add one more point. That's in extension to Nichols. We know 2023 is a chat GPT world, right? A new thing yeah. came up. And I'm just going directly to the environmental impact. So I read through a few articles and it is clearly stating that GPT-4, which is actually having 1 trillion parameters, is a super large language model. And oh. that is emitting nearly 50,000 cubic foot of carbon dioxide after having all this green energy protection. I don't know whether more and more parameters we are going to involve and definitely it will take more energy to actually calculate and give all the answers. Thank you for sharing the insights. Yeah. Yep. I guess the next important thing is data management frameworks. In the book, it mentions that data management professionals need to account for the challenges that are inherent in trying to derive value from the enterprise asset while balancing strategic and operational goals, specific businesses and technical requirements, risk and compliance demands, and conflicting understandings of what data represents and whether it is of high quality. An organization's approach to data management depends on the key factors such as the industry, the range of data it uses, the culture of the company, the maturity level, and just specific challenges that it's trying to address. So that's actually where we get to the first couple models mentioned in this book. The first is a strategic alignment model, SAM, in a nutshell. Well, it basically looks at the center relationship between the data and information. And there's actually a nice little visual I can show you all. This one here, it's on page 34. One of the things that I brought down here was there's four fundamental domains of the SAM model, business strategy, information technology strategy, organizational infrastructure, and process and information technology infrastructure. This is just wow. another good thing that I would recommend to get familiar with. Could be an exam question, but most likely not. And then the other one I was mentioning was the Amsterdam information model. What I wrote down here was that both Amsterdam and the SAM model are both strategic. It takes a strategic approach on business and IT alignment. On page 35, the nine cell, where it recognizes the middle layer that focuses on structure and tactics, includes planning and architecture, and also recognizes the necessity of information communication. And that, for those who don't have a dim box, is this one here. This is the Amsterdam model. And then next is actually the big one, the Dama wheel or the Dama dim box framework. This is basically just saying that at the heart of data governance, you have other critical core areas, which is basically what the other chapters in the book mention. So in the center is data governance, but you have data architecture, data modeling, data storage and operations, data security, data integration, document and content management, reference and master data, data warehousing and business intelligence, metadata management, and data quality management. All of these are critical components that ensure successful data governance or the management of data assets. Governance is the strategic approach that you take to ensure you have a proper strategy to manage your data assets. Now I want you all to skip to page 40. I just want to talk a little bit about the Aiken pyramid. This is basically kind of like similar to the one I just showed you the wheel. I'll show you a little picture real quick. Same thing as the other one. It just shows that data governance lies at the very foundation of these other pillars like data architecture, data quality, metadata. It's split into different phases. Phase one, that's where you have the data security, data storage, and operations. There could be a chance there could be a question on the Aiken pyramid. And this is a good one to get yourself familiarized with. And then lastly, on page 42, there's another really good visual here, just the different kinds of data management functions. So I'll show you that it's in black and white, so it's a little bit more easier to read. It just shows different functions of data management. On the top, you have data governance, so they provide the oversight, the strategy, the data valuation, developing the principles and ethics, the policies, stewardship, and a big part with the culture change, which I had mentioned, it's definitely like one of the bigger challenges. Then when it comes to the life cycle management, that's where you have plan and design, use and enhance, and enable and maintain. And then lastly, the foundational activities include the data risk management. So that's where you have to be concerned about security, make sure the data is properly classified, make sure that you're thinking about data ethics and complying with other things like GDPR, make sure people's data isn't being misused in a way that they don't give permission. You know, metadata management is also a foundational activity as is data quality management. It's a small chapter in terms of the actual percentage of the exam, but it really just answers the why. Why are we concerned with these other areas that are covered later in the chapters? 
I can take some questions on the exam or this chapter. Hugh asked, are the Dhamma exams open book or do we need to somehow memorize all these frameworks? No. So this is open book. That's why I was actually mentioning, put a sticky note on page 22, even this Aiken pyramid, put like a little sticky note on the outside so you can refer back to it when you're taking the exam. But you can use a physical book during the exam. You can also use a PDF on a computer, but that computer cannot be your main computer and it cannot be connected to the internet either. Proctors will also check for this stuff too, but that's also a little bit beneficial if you want to just control or command F while taking the exam. I think it'll be a little faster, but it depends on your personal preference. And I just also want to add, you cannot use both. Yeah. So when Dama says one book, they mean one implementation of book. You can either have the physical DMBOK or the PDF on a second device, but not both. Think about that as you're taking your notes, because you can always copy them into whatever manifestation of the book you end up choosing, but that would kind of be a pain in the butt. You should probably try to figure out your strategy as you're getting started. When you do purchase the CDMP exam, you will be provided with this tool called Canvas. And from there, you can actually access over 200 practice test questions. I would highly recommend that you just consistently test yourselves. You only have a minute per question. So at least just getting the pace right. And also maybe if you want to practice using the book or referring back to it, try to see which one's faster. Do I get the answers faster when I'm using the PDF or when I have a physical book? Well, you can just also practice that aspect too. I have a question. So on the exam, does it cover any of the pyramids that you shared? It could. Data management is a small chapter, 2%, two questions. Mm -hmm. There could mm -hmm. always be a small chance that you might encounter a question that asks you about the components, about the Aiken pyramid. I was just recommend just getting familiar, just understanding like the basics of what these different frameworks, these different models, I want to say spend the whole day understanding like, every single component. Question, not really mm -hmm. surrounding the actual exam, but on mm -hmm. page 37, there's the generic context diagram, which I think is used through the book as a sort of a summary. Can you just explain the core concepts of what that's representing and how it's useful to understand each chapter? These context diagrams, you encounter them more in the other chapters of the book. It kind of gives a good overview of let's say data governance. What's the primary deliverables? What are the kinds of inputs? What are the primary goals? Data governance and other chapters beyond. You will actually see this diagram that more filled out though. This is just a very generic example. I'm pretty sure if I go to the data governance one, this is actually one that I see in the very beginning of a lot of these chapters. Our other career coach mm -hmm. was saying he got a lot of value out of the diagrams. They don't really do anything for me. He said he sticky noted all of them and that was his main go-to when he had questions. And he also took his notes mm. on the page across from the context diagram so that he could reference mm. the notes and the diagrams. They're meant to show the different mm -hmm. input drivers, deliverables. I'm just thinking if, that, if that's the core things you need to focus on for that chapter, is that a good way to say, right, if I can understand what's going on, I've got a good handle of each area, I can understand the inputs and outputs, and, or is that too still too high level? No, I think that's actually, it's really good to understand this stuff because I've even encountered test TDMP questions that are like, what's the primary deliverable of data governance or which one of these would be deliverables or which one of these is not? That's actually another type of question that you might encounter. You'll have four right answers and one incorrect one. So it'll ask you like, which one of these is not a deliverable from data governance or something like that. Some of the content that is referenced in the context diagrams is not referenced in the chapter. They're not perfect. <laughs> I think the editing of this book could have been better. I'm sorry. I feel like I'm so critical, but I'm really just like staring at it every day. And so I'm like, wow, it is really much more helpful than not. But I think some of the content is a holdover from DMBOK version one. You know, it is what it is. You, you mentioned that the new version is coming out sometime soon. So they say it's coming out in 2025. There's no chance of the exam changing anytime soon. No. In fact, I have also been told that even if they write the book and they publish the book, then it's going to take them another year to update the exam. So it's yep. going to be a while. We felt comfortable going through and updating all of our questions. It's going to be a minute. Thank you. Any other questions about the exam, about this chapter? I think you mentioned something about Canva. So if we register as if we're going to take the exam and there's access to practice questions related mm -hmm. to the exam, is that what you're saying? Yep. There's 200 test questions that you're given. And so another cool thing is the Canvas app, you can actually download on your phone. So it's also really nice because you can just like practice the question if you're like on a bus or just taking a walk on your phone. You can test yourself on the go, basically. And actually another cool thing about the exam that I forgot to mention, there is no set date that you can take it. You can purchase the exam and then you can just take it whenever you feel like you're ready. How much is it again? Um, it's 300 <laughs> and then they charge an $11 fee for the online proctoring. I think it's always proctored online. So I think it's always $311.
which is a really good deal. Like the Microsoft certs, I think they start around almost 500. Like they're definitely in the upper 400. So it's reasonable, especially if you can convince somebody at your company to pay for it for you. That's always <laughs> oh, yeah. the goal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> what, what I want to ask is after mm-hmm. I purchase the uh, exam and before I literally take the exam, whether the time I can practice as much longer as I, as I want, like several months, I'm asking is, is there a kind of constraints after I purchase to actually participate the test? Nope, no timing. You just take them when you're comfortable. Good, thank you. You have to just log in back to the Canvas tool. There's two modules, one on like the test question, and then there's a button where you just press, okay, now I'm ready to take the actual exam. Once you're ready, just go there, and the next stage will take you to do that. Just don't procrastinate too much. Don't forget about it. Be like, <laughs> oh yeah, I purchased the exam. I forgot about that. That's why I- having a study buddy really helps. So keep yeah. coming to these discussion groups. And if you haven't already, I also really encourage you to join the CDMP study group on Facebook. So this is another good question. How is the CDMP different from other certs? First off, DAMA, the parent organization that publishes the CDMP, they're very highly regarded in the world of data. There are a lot of the frameworks are used by companies throughout. So I feel like having their certification really will help you stand out, whether it's like if you want to look for a new job or maybe get promoted. So DAMA is a very reputable company in the world of data. So that's why I would think to go for the CDMP. Another one I want to call out is the EDM Council's ECAM certification. They're pretty much a direct competitor to DAMA and they're really good. They publish excellent thought leadership materials. So I definitely recommend checking them out. The DCAM certification is also very highly regarded. We just don't train for that one because it's way more expensive relative to the CDMP. Another thing is the EDM Council has its roots in the financial industry. So if you're coming from outside of the finance world, not that it's not relevant, it is still data is data no matter what the content of that data is about. I think that Dama does a better job of being truly industry neutral. So Chitra asks, I want to know if the 90-day study plan is the one to find the study buddy you mentioned earlier. That's a spreadsheet that Nicole can, I think, send the link to. Yes, that is free. And we separately have a 90-day study plan, which is a paid product. I wrote it back in 2020 when I took the exam because I felt like this book is really long, right? And so I wanted a reading guide for the book. If you're like me and you want to try to space out your reading so that you can really retain the material and use it to enhance your performance on the job, then you might benefit from the 90-day study plan. It's essentially like, here's the key concepts, here's the topics you should read this week. And then at the end of the week, checking your knowledge, making sure you grokked the core information. That was our first ever product. One thing I just want to add too, is that on top of the questions that you get when you purchase the CDMP, Data Strategy Professionals also has our own test questions as well that are different from the ones that CDMP provides. So if you're just looking for additional practice test questions, those are also available. People have said really great things, found them really helpful. Yeah. We try to make them really good. And the practice questions from Dama are a great place to start because they're free and because you know that they're going to match the format of what you see on the real exam. The more practice questions, the better, right? When we wrote ours, we also really emphasized creating explanations. We recently published an update so you can see the chapter, the section title, and the page number and find exactly what you need to review the content. And we also try to explain the answer as thoroughly as possible. And it's good because yeah. like, it also tells you like, a specific section in the book where to look into if you want to get more information. It's good study material. Yeah. I'm really, really excited. We want to come out with an exam simulator super soon. Definitely before the publication of DM Bach V3. <laughs> but yeah, we're going to eventually have a platform that you can subscribe to where you can do unlimited questions out of our test bank. SJ asks, is there a set of questions by chapter to test the material the material is being read? On exam, you will get the questions in order of the chapters in the DM Bach. So if nothing changes, which it won't, the CDMP is you get two questions on chapter one, you get two questions on chapter two, and you get 11 questions on chapter three, and so on. I was thinking, Nicole, some textbooks, at the end of every chapter, there's practice test questions. I think that'd be good from the dim box, maybe V3, we could suggest that. Yeah, they could make it more like a textbook, because it's really like a reference book. Yeah. Did you all say that the CDMP questions are in order based off of like the chapters of the book? Is that what you said? On the CDMP exam, mm-hmm. yeah, they are in order. I like that. It's good to know. Do you guys have a calendar? Like, how do I know when the next one is? 
Yeah, we send out emails. And also we use this app called Luma to host the events. And I put my phone number in Luma and so it texts me. So I will not miss this because it's pinging me. So you can sign up for everything for the rest of this year. I have a question. Is there a study group or LinkedIn? Mm -hmm. So we come together and kind of study together. That's my question. On Facebook, it's called CDMP study group. And then on LinkedIn, we have a different group called data strategy professionals. And okay, I'm going to set it up now, but yeah, primarily historically, we have used Facebook for that purpose. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Yep, I see that Sachitra asked. Yes, we will upload our recordings to YouTube. We also have a previous recording from last year as well. So if you want to look ahead, there's always that option. Last year we did co-working sessions. So they were a little different format than the discussion groups that we're doing this year, where we used what's called the Pomodoro method to encourage people to block off the time to read on their own. This was awesome. Thank you guys so much for all your feedback. It really helps us to grow and improve. Thank you. Thank you all, and have a great rest of your day. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.